Simple free energy. Welcome to Renaissance Charge videos. I'm Rick Friedrich. Today we're going to talk about simple free energy. So we're going to look at taking a motor and charging a battery with the motor at the same time. Now we are going to do a test <coughs> where we have a fan that's running, a brushless fan, and we are going to run it <coughs> normally. And then we're going to take another fan, identical fan, that we are going to run it normally, but also charging another battery. So what am I talking about here? What we're talking about is along the lines of what I've taught over the years on selfish circuits or loving paths. And that is an idea of um, <clears throat> taking a motor and expanding its use of driving a mechanical load to also driving an electrical load. So we're going to any kind of energy that we get electrically out of the motor is free so long as the input stays the same and the mechanical output stays the same. Now if we're talking about 1% or something like that then I don't think anybody would care but if it's 10%, 20, 50, 90 or 100% more output than what you normally get, then that's pretty significant. So that's the relevance of it. <clears throat> Again, we're looking at a motor here. This is a brushless motor. And what we have is a flyback diode. Why is that there? It's a snubber system, it's called. When you open and close the loop we have what's called a transient energy manifestation and what we need to do is protect the switching by putting some kind of suppression system in there and that's what it is it, it is a suppression system in more than one way <laughs> suppressing the transient and also suppressing your free energy gain. So this is a loop across the motor coil and this is another loop across the battery and the motor. We're not going to get into anything but the very basics here. So <clears throat> why did I choose the brushless motor? Well, this is one of the first motors that I converted over to run this way. Back in 2005, what I did was I took a brushless motor here that someone had gave, given me. In fact, there's a video in 2006 of me explaining some of this stuff. But this is a shorter video <laughs> and it's free. So back in 2005, I went around to all these major campuses across the U.S. And um, pretty much everywhere except for the Northwest, which is where I ended up living. And I went to all these campuses and I brought this with me. Now it had a different fan on the top here. Um, and basically... This doesn't work anymore because it's been dumped around and um, but that's not the point. <laughs> I can make it work but it, it's not really ideal. But this was my first model and this the point is to talk about the first model that I had. It was pretty crude here and it was just running off these little alkaline batteries. <clears throat> so I took this around the campuses now as as a missionary going around talking to um, to the kids on the college campuses 
and giving out books for free. No, I'm not like those uh, crazy campus preachers. Um, I was actually going against a lot of what they were saying and the students loved that. So, but one of the points that I wanted to bring this, bring up was, you know, a different perspective, right? So this was an example of getting the students to think outside the box, literally. <clears throat> so what happened was, I would get into these debates on philosophical and religious subjects with um, students, either Christians or atheists or whatever religion people had, and I would often get the science students at the tech schools really have a hard time with this demonstration. And so what would happen was, I would be running this, charging a battery, and I had my voltmeter and all that, and we would be looking at the voltage charging over time, and I would rotate these batteries around. One would be powering it, and one would be charging. <clears throat> now this doesn't make sense, because normally you're not charging a battery with the motor. So what happened was, a lot of times I would ask the students, the, the guys who had access to a lab, I'd say, go get me a battery, you know, you've got to have at least one battery that's completely dead, you know, it's been in a clock, and it's been running, and it's down to zero, right, or, you know, in a voltmeter or something, so they would go and fish around, they'd find a battery that was completely dead, and then I would put it on the charging side, and after 10 minutes, I would disconnect it, we would measure it, we'd see a voltage there, and then I would put it on the input, right? Now we could tell it was the input because I would just leave the, the charging battery uh, clip here disconnected, and I would run it. And then I would get them to touch this, and they would get a shock. It would be a 90 volt shock, even if there was 3 volts on this battery, it would be a 90 volt shock, and it would make them really go like that. So we would run it, and then we would start charging up the battery that had been running it in now reversed. After 10 minutes again running, we're charging up the battery again. So, of course, I would go, go on to other subjects with them, and, or we would continue on that subject and showing them the circuit. And they could see it all there, you know, this is demonstrated in the real world here, guys. Not, we're not trying to prove something over the internet, but this was in the real world. So thousands and thousands of students back in 2005 got to see this, this wonderful looking contraption, <laughs> and be amazed. Now, um, of course, they're not going to have access to that particular motor, so to be able to judge and figure out, but it was just something to look at and consider. So over the years, I made various models. These were my earliest models, and um, really crude looking, the circuit hanging out. And then I decided to do a very basic model change. And I decided to use the existing circuitry and literally just remove the one diode right here and reposition it, reposition it <coughs> to charge the battery. So this is why I call it a selfish circuit because it consumes the energy right here upon itself and now it's sharing the energy. I can just leave them out open like this. So a selfish circuit, loving path, <laughs> loving circuit, sharing, sharing the energy. Now, what we're looking at is also what's called a single body, and this is called a many body. So it's more than one body. So the circuit is normally everything tied to the ground terminal and it's a single system. In this case we have two different bodies, two independent bodies. We have this loop right here which 
is, um, is really the single entity. And this is really considered the same thing, even though this is really a secondary body. It's not being used as such, it's just closed to itself. But this is going out, <coughs> excuse me, to a second loop. So that is called a many body, two bodies. Now we can expand that further, and that's not the purpose of this video. So now, what we have is a demonstration here. Alright, so what we're going to do is run this, and I've got a meter here. Now we're going to turn it to CFMs. We could choose a variety of <coughs> excuse me. We could choose a variety of of options there. And so what I'm going to do is line this up exactly to the edge, exactly there, and we're going to see. I'm going to probably have to hold it like down here because it's going to blow it over. Now we're going to run this at 24 volts. Now, I'm not trying to prove anything over the internet, and I'm going to explain that later on, why that's important. But I'm just going to give you a demonstration. Oops. Hold on. I'm going to put this so it doesn't roll away on me. So what we're going to see is it's going to run at the exact same RPM. So it's fluctuating about 155. Wait, time, no, I can't do that while I'm watching. All right, it's times 10. So it goes up depending on where I hold it. I don't want to stand in front of it. Okay, so what? We're going to look at it right on the edge here. 155 to 166, it bounces back and forth, times 10. So 1600, about 15, 1559 or whatever, to 16, 1630 around. And that is times 10. Yeah, times 10. All right, so now we're going to remember that. And I'll bring the camera up close after. I don't want to move it while we're... Anyway, I'll, I'll come back to that later. Now, what we've done... This is the same fan. So what we're going to do now So 2105 So now, we're going to connect up these wires. Let's see how I can do this in a way that everybody can see what's going on here. So these are the original wires, just like these were. And these are the added wires after I convert this. Now, thousands upon thousands of people have done this, so this is not something new. 
that I'm trying to show here, but for those of you who don't know this, I'm just doing it for your sake. Alright, so what we're going to do now is run this again. Wait, does it blow away? We're going to watch it start charging. Oh, oh we got to connect it. <laughs> So we can see it's charging, and you can see the amp draw, and then again, oops, I shouldn't stand in front of it, 1500 times 10, maybe just right in the spot. I get this right exactly. Oh, you know what? I know what. There we go. <laughs> I had that piece in the way. So we got up to 1700, but I got to move it just right so we're in the same spot. So 1600. Sixteen to seventeen hundred. So what I need to do is go back. Well, anyway, so we're looking at the charging. It is charging. It doesn't really matter how much, as long as it is significant. Let's go back now to look at this one because I didn't. I got to make sure that it's a proper comparison that I'm not blocking the airflow here, like I was just doing on the other one. So we want to do it just like that so it's exactly the same. Oops. All right. So you can see it's the same 1600 Right? I mean, why wouldn't it be? Right? You can see that's turned off now, it's holding a charge. And let's look at the amps now again. I forgot to look myself. This, so you can see it's, it's actually a little bit more, again, how much, depending on how much air I'm blocking here. So we're actually removing the back EMF a little bit in this system and that's why this is drawing a little bit more producing the same airflow. So this one was brand new out of the box yesterday. It arrived and this one I've, I've had converted for a while. So now let me get um, the camera down here so that you can see exactly what we're talking about. Alright, 
so. Let's go back. Let's see. One amp, hundred, yeah, let's see, about 140 milliamps. Do this with all the fans except not all of them are easy to access. Excess. And again, let's just keep this here so it holds it up snug. And we need to remember to keep this open. All right, so now we're going to look at. here we've got this wire going all the way over here's this is 24 volts this wire is just a jumper wire and this wire is positive now we are charging the battery
<laughs> That's a lot. Well, I don't need to show how much airflow that is because we have a meter for it. Anyway, we can see the charging. Now, I'm not here to try and prove how much free energy or to prove anything really. I'm just showing everybody how to do it. That's been my point. So let's talk about that again. Let's go into that a little bit further. Now I could run other loads. I could run other loads. Um, but I want to keep this video short to the point. And what we could just a couple more things to say. Um, what I have done here in this case, now these two are these three are actually products that we have on our um, renaissance charge r-charge.com website now this part is not but in this case what I did was I didn't even remove the fan but I put a little three phase generator motor <coughs> this wasn't anything special it was just something I grabbed and I glued that on there so anyway, <coughs> excuse me, I got it cold. So what we have here is the input, the output, plus a secondary output, or a third <laughs> output here, in which I can um, run this for additional electrical power loading down the motor. And um, the other thing to mention is there's about five different ways of doing this. Um, what we can do is the first way is the simplest way, just moving the diode around, actually adding a second diode because there's two transistors in there. Um, the second way, which is what we've done for years, is replace the circuit entirely with um, another circuit. We use one of the four coils inside to okay, this one comes off. So we actually um, <coughs> use one of the coils here as a trigger coil instead of the hall, the internal hall that is with the circuit normally. And this one is still has it on the side. Actually there's two. And then um, that gives us more negative energy is what we call, which is not important to know at this point, uh, but the energy is called negative. Conventionally speaking, it is negative energy. It's transient is what people think it is. Now what we do is we replace it with, with a different kind of switching with a trigger coil. Now that doesn't allow for the exact um, same CFMs and all that input and CFMs as this one, but this one, this circuit allows for more one-to-one -one charging. In this case, we're not getting 200% energy out like this one would have. This one can allow you to like this one too, to charge another battery at the rate that the first one is discharging, more or less. Um, if you have a sulfated battery, it's going to want to desulfate the battery, and that's not an efficient process. And a battery that's been sitting for three or four months is already partly sulfated. 
Now, a very small battery, too, is going to be an inefficient um, kind of bottlenecking of a charging battery. So the bigger the battery that's being charged, the more total energy is going to manifest because this is a converging energy. It's not a dissipative energy. Now, you don't have to believe me on that. You can see for yourself. Now, I've been doing this for 15 years full time, so um, I, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> But anyway, I don't expect anybody to believe me because they need to prove things to themselves. Now there's another couple of different ways. I can unwind one of those coils and, and put um, a parallel wire to make the trigger coil parallel. Now, this is like a bifiler arrangement for one of those coils. That way I can still use the motor coil of the, the original wire motor coil the same way. So that would be the most improved version so far to get the maximum efficiency out of it. And in that trigger coil, we can actually power a bulb. So we can actually produce um, the same amount of energy in the trigger resistance side of the circuit. It's not so important to consider that. You can see that in my other videos. So that's the third way. Excuse me. The fourth way now would be to um, uh, remove the um, transistors, because so far we've only been talking about transistor setups, and use a MOSFET with a gate driver. Now we can still use the internal hull for that, like we do in our other motors that we make. Now we can make a faster switching time, so we can make the circuit more efficient. And these are reportedly in the 90 percentile um, efficiency ratings for these motors. But we can improve upon that even a little bit, and our output is going to increase, um, just like we have in our regular motors. So now we can get even higher output with that. Now there's another fifth way, um, and that would be just simply uh, rearranging, um, running each coil individually with its own transistor or MOSFET <clears throat> instead of having them all paralleled. So that is not important to get into. Anyway, these are my models. And now, again, I want to stress <clears throat> why I am saying that you cannot prove something over the internet. Now, I did a whole video on this, and um, I proved the point over hundreds of uh, email posts on overunity.com, and the guys kind of conceded to that. They kind of admitted, but I took all their fun away because they were believing that they could disprove a over unity claim or a free energy claim with a video and I said nope you can't either prove an over unity or free energy claim through video to somebody else <laughs> over the internet and you cannot disprove it because you can always fake something and you can always uh, be mistaken about something you are not here right now even though some of you think you are. <laughs> some of you are so, maybe not you guys who are watching, but some of these other guys, um, are so into your um, science fiction reality and TVs and movies and now the internet that you're so engrossed into it, you think you're there, but you're not. You have no idea of the environmental conditions here. You have no idea of the batteries that I'm using here. You have no idea, you can see it's holding a charge. Um, you have no idea if these batteries are sulfated. Now these are relatively new batteries, they're not sulfated. But I'm just saying that, right? How can you know anything that I'm saying? Um, you have no idea what's all going on exactly. If there was some kind of manipulation, like, like maybe, right, here's the plug, maybe there was something connected up to this box or something. Maybe there was something under the table. In this case, I'm not sure why anything could be under the table, but, but I can't 
prove it. I cannot prove something that only you can prove in the real world to yourself. Now, this should be self-evident. That's basic science, right? You do repeated tests over time with all sorts of locations around the world to make sure this is not some situational um, environmental situation. We, we hear of people who couldn't replicate something in another area. Why? Um, very strange claim to make if you can't repeat it somewhere else. Now there might be some circumstances, uh, altitude or whatever, that would affect um, some experiments, of course. But when we're talking about something like this, my criteria for a free energy device has to meet all these conditions where it's universally, you know, that you can uh, use it universally around the world. Maybe at, you know, the Antarctic in the winter time, the batteries would not work the same. We can all understand that. But we're talking about indoors in the Antarctic room temperature. That's the same temperature there as anywhere else. So it's not so hard to understand that, that a video is meant to inform you so that you can repeat it in the real world yourself.